Um, so uh, we're going to start the second session. And the uh, first speaker is Dr. Nick Gans, who's at UT Arlington Research Institute. And uh, just, uh, just so you all know, he was my uh, PhD advisor, so I might be a little bit biased. And uh, thanks, Nick, for organizing this workshop. And uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Kaveh, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I'll be presenting this work on five point algorithms for estimating pose and velocity. Um, and you can see there's a number of collaborators that I have, including Kaveh. This part of this was uh, part of his PhD dissertation work uh, that we've since continued. I'll be presenting up to the current status, which is really even as of yesterday, squeezing some of the results out to include in the presentation here. Um, so we'll be going over just a general outline of what division-based motion estimation is or what we mean by that. Then our two main algorithms, one is the quaternion-based pose estimation, the other velocity estimation, and then the cur our current efforts, which is to combine these two, uh, but I don't have a catchy acronym like Quest and Best, so I need to come up with something there. So uh, our objective when we talk about camera relative motion estimation is that given images from two cameras or alternately one camera is moving and taking multiple pictures, we want to find the relative rotation translation uh, between these the cameras. Um, and what we're adding to this now as well is the angular and linear velocity of the camera as it's moving. Uh, Kave was talking about something similar to this during his talk, and he called the structure from motion, which is perhaps a, a more common term for this. Um, but we are focusing more on the motion than on any collection of the point clouds or 3D estimation. So that's why we prefer this term. But there's a lot of different applications, uh, a big one being SLAM. So here's some work that we've done um, where we're using the, this is the TUM data set, but we're conducting SLAM in the TUM data set. Uh, again, you sort of saw Kavi doing some um, some slam work earlier, but also we do have a lot of work in um, motion based, sorry, vision based control. So we're getting robots to go fetch objects or to guide vehicles through environments, et cetera. So we want to estimate where objects are or how the camera is moving. Um, so this is. Uh, certainly not a, a new problem. In fact, it goes back 40 years. I was a little surprised to realize that. Uh, with the eight-point algorithm, which is just famous and quite well used still to this day. Um, and then, you know, some more uh, work was done in, in late, later years, introducing the homography matrix, which is also very widely used uh, still. Um, so one thing is that these methods have some shortcomings. So the famous eight point algorithm requires the points not be coplanar, whereas the homography requires points do be coplanar. You have to have these eight feature points and four feature points found. Um, and also the um, eight point algorithm breaks down if the translation is very small. And so that's bad for control, maybe moving towards a location where the, the relative translation is small. So in more recent years, there's been a lot of work on these so-called five-point algorithms that um, can alleviate a lot of these problems. But however, uh, they still are based on the essential matrix, which is the heart of the eight-point algorithm. So they can still have some of these problems that the eight-point algorithm has, such as problems when the translation is very small. Um, and also that the coplanar feature points are, can cause some issues. Um, a problem that's widely overlooked, though, is velocity estimation. So this is um, also related to visual odometry, but very, very widely people are estimating the position, translation, rotation between um, where images were taken, but the estimating the velocity is not something that has been explored very deeply. And so, sorry, these are some of the results on um, estimating velocity from image data. And so we can see that there is a continuous time version of the uh, essential matrix and homography matrices. And then also people typically works using Kalman filters merged with the 
pose-based methods that, that estimate rotation and translation. But what I'll be talking about is directly estimating pose and velocity at the same time from the same set of images. We're not using these essential homography matrices that are most commonly used. Um, it is a five-point algorithm, which is proven to be the minimal number of feature points you possibly need in order to um, conduct this task. Um, the five points can be in any configuration, so the planar, non-planar is not an issue. It works when there's zero translation or zero rotation, and we don't require any a priori knowledge of the environment. Now, there is one big caveat here, which is that for any monocular motion estimation scheme or um, structure for motion uh, approach, you can only recover the translation up to an unknown scale factor. Um, you can now, with some additional knowledge, such as the size of objects in the scene, or if you have an IMU that's giving you some uh, additional information, you can recover that scale factor. Otherwise, you're recovering, trying to recover everything up to some common scale factor. So let's get into the, the meat of this. So um, the problem is that uh, it's expressed as a rigid motion constraints that relate the coordinates of the image feature points um, to the rotation and translation and the depth of those feature points. So you can see an example here where you say that a uh, camera, each camera has a Tegian reference frame associated with it, and the cameras are viewing a set of common points. And for instance, if we look at one point in 3D that's out in front of these cameras, we'll say in one camera view, it projects to a point called M, and in another camera view, it projects to a point called N. Uh, the rigid motion constraint then just says that the rotation and translation and the depths um, must obey this set of constraints with the location of the feature points. Another way to say it is, given the rotation, translation, and depths, and the location of one feature point in one image, it tells you where that feature point must lie in the other image. Um, now, if we look at the velocity uh, um, version of this, then it's a little bit different. Uh, it's a similar structure, but in this case, we see that we have angular velocity and velocity, and we end up with an additional term due to the, the derivative of the depth. So overall, what we're trying to do is given known feature points M and N and a known optical flow vector in a set of images, we're trying to recover the unknown rotation, translation, angular velocity, linear velocity, and the set of depths. So just as an illustration, um, we have an example where, you know, say a point is uh, captured in one image and then tracked to a, that corresponding point in another image. This is the rigid motion constraint that would be for that point, uh, where again, rotation, translation, depths are not known. Uh, and we would do this for a set of points. Um, the corresponding um, for the velocity is a little bit different again, but in this case, rather than looking at two images, we have one image and the optical flow of the points in that image essentially the velocity of the points in that image. Um, that is still generally calculated by comparing two images, and there's a number of different methods to estimate optical flow that um, I won't get into here. Okay, we also, um, we, in our, in our approach to the point algorithm, we are um, leveraging, leveraging the quaternion formulation for rotation. So, uh, I don't want to get too much, spend too much time on this, but just suffice to know that rotations um, can be expressed as a quaternion, which is a collection of four elements. Um, every rotation matrix corresponds to a quaternion, and you can map back and forth between rotation matrices and quaternions. The advantage of the quaternions is that you only have four terms to keep track of instead of nine. Um, and so if you are given a quaternion um, with values W, X, Y, Z, you can calculate the rotation matrix with this equation here. And there's also for rotations, uh, an additional constraint that the, um, the quaternion, which is not truly a vector, but if you consider it to be a vector, it has a norm of one, or else you can just think that there is a constraint on the elements that they're, um, the product of their squares must equal one. 
And then I always like to throw out this uh, great quote by Lord Kelvin that Eternians are an unmixed evil to those who have touched them in, in any way. So let's go ahead and start into the, how the algorithm works. Um, I'm really glossing over the details here. So, um, you know, please see the paper that um, our, our robotics and, or sorry, our uh, yeah, robotics and automation letters paper from a few years ago for a lot more of the detail. Um, but if we look at our constraint, remember we're trying to recover the rotation translation and these depths, everything orange here. The problem is we have this nonlinear relationship where these are multiplied and so that makes recovering them pretty hard. Um, so the method, this is really all due to Kave, um, is pretty clever here. So first, um, we want to isolate R. So we want to get rid of the translation and the depths. So to get rid of the translation, we just take the set of equations we would have for any two feature points, them from each other. And now we can see that the translation is gone, right? Because they have to have the same translation within their um, rigid body equations. Likewise, they have the same rotation. Now we wanna get rid of these depths that are hanging out here and preventing us from recovering the rotation. So um, what we do is if you think of the variables um, U and V as, or sorry, if you think of the depths U and V as variables and the rotation and the feature point locations as coefficients, we can rewrite this into a linear set of equations which has zero on the right-hand side. So you can see we're just rewriting the set of equations in a matrix vector form. And we have this matrix we're calling M. We notice though that uh, M by definition is not full rank. Um, since it, the, the, the matrix times this vector equals zero, it must have a null space. So that means we can take the determinant of M and it must equal zero. And this determinant is a polynomial equation of known coefficients. Everybody's coefficients are functions of the feature point coordinates. And we have a bunch of fourth order uh, terms of the quaternions, but those depths are now gone. So all that's left is the rotation terms that we wanted to recover. Um, and this is because of the fact that the rotation matrix, remember, has this form of W, X, Y, and Z. So um, if we have three, uh, remember, we need three feature points in order to create that M matrix. So if we have five feature points, uh, choose three, that gives us 10 equations that we can use to try to solve this. Um, set of, of um, simultaneously solve this set of polynomial equations. We have an additional equation from the uh, quaternion constraints. So that gives us 11 equations in four variables. So um, this is a, um, a polynomial root solving problem. And that is, there's a lot of different ways you can solve it. Uh, Relinearization and the Grubner bases are um, popular methods. We use both of them, um, but we ended up developing our own method, which again, I'll, I'll skip the details here because it, it's quite complicated and kind of outside the, everything I want to talk about today. But please do go see that paper, um, that RAL paper, because this, this approach can be used for a large number of different kinds of polynomial problems. So once um, we have solved this set of equations, U, X, Y, and Z back, we can use that to recover the rotation matrix. And then we can go look back at our um, rigid body motion equation, where now we can see that we can add R to our set of known terms. So um, recovering U, T, and V can now be done through a linear set of, solving a set of linear equations. Um, so we can solve this and we get the three translation terms, the 10 depth terms, the depths of that of the points in both camera views. Um, we will note that this matrix is not square. It's generally not going to have a right null space. So you end up just finding the, the singular vector corresponding to the smallest singular value. So we did a lot of work uh, comparing this to um, existing approaches to the five point algorithm. So we looked at a bunch of these different, um, um, sorry, open source data sets that uh, are publicly available and they have good ground truths. We can compare them against these methods. We also only compared ourselves against methods where the people were sharing codes so we could be sure that we were um, using the best of uh, 
source code uh, for the, each of these methods. And our method is in uh, blue here, and we can see how it outperformed the other methods in terms of um, accuracy in recovering the translation and rotation compared to the others. Uh, one caveat, though, is our approach is quite a bit slower than the other methods. Um, most of these other ones did use things like the Grubner basis or relinearization in order to solve their approach. Um, but in general, we're still well above the frame rate in order to solve a problem, so we can operate at better than 30 hertz. Uh, but if you have a massive data set, um, many sometimes you collect thousands of images, you try to process things offline. Um, yeah, we might have a bit of a problem in terms of the um, the speed of the operation at that point. So, um, you know, like I said, we can use this in vision-based control. So we did this right here. This is uh, in simulation, but it's in the Microsoft Environment Air Sim, which is uh, very highly accurate. So in this case, we were doing formation control where each UAV extracts a set of feature points within its field of view. Um, then they, um, in order to match between the UAVs so they can share some information and figure out their inter-displacement between each other, they share their descriptions, the, 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 sorry, the feature descriptors with each other. Um, so they don't have to share the images, so the bandwidth is not terribly large. They're sharing the descriptors of the feature points that they've seen. They can send these out to the neighboring UAVs and then each UAV compares its set of descriptors with descriptors from its neighbors. And at that point, they can determine the, uh, the rotation and translation between them. So you can see an example here of the views from two different UAVs and, and matching their descriptors. And using that recovered pose, we then use this in a formation control strategy. Um, and we did we'll do note that the um, that scale translation is not going to affect the convergence to the proper shape of the formation, but we use um, a known height, which could be acquired either through an altimeter or through um, a downward facing LIDAR in order to make sure that the scale of the formation is correct, not just the shape of it. And here you can start to see them finally get into formation. So on the, uh, yeah, on the left, you can see the shared sets of feature points that they're each extracting. So next is the Vest algorithm. And at this point, it'll go a little bit quicker because it's very, very similar to the Quest algorithm. And so in fact, I, um, had a, a student who could join the group and I asked him to look into this, basically it's a question of, we know how Quest works, the rigid body set of equations is very similar for velocity as it is for, um, for rotation and translation. So can we use the exact same process in order to uh, find the velocity terms? And the answer is yes. And in fact, it's a little bit easier because the angular velocity only has three terms and not four terms like the quaternion. But the steps are exactly the same. So we do the same thing. We take um, two feature points, um, or actually we should say a point and um, its optical flow vector from two different uh, points. We subtract them. That gets the velocity, linear velocity term out of our set of equations. Um, in order to estimate Sorry, in order to eliminate the depths of these feature points, we do the same thing where we get a third point, also figure out its, um, its equation in this form. We write it into the matrix form. We have that exact same form, right, where we have this matrix times a vector, and then it must be equal to zero. Instead of that quaternion form for the rotation matrix, we just have the three terms in the angular velocity. Do the same thing, we take the determinants, we now have a polynomial in three, third order, instead of fourth order. 
Um, and again, we can use all sorts of different methods in order to solve that set of polynomial equations. Uh, we used a, an approach that was essentially the same as the one that uh, Kave had developed in his uh, earlier work. So again, we need five points to give us 10 equations, and that's enough to solve the set of equations in order to get the rotation matrix. And once we recover the rotation matrix, we uh, can recover the linear and angular velocity by solving a set of linear equations. So um, we tested this on the Kitty data set. Uh, the Kitty data set is a car driving data set, if you're not familiar with it. Um, so here's just a snapshot out of there where uh, at one point the vehicle turns left and we do see this nice angular velocity bump. Um, we also see a, a shift to the side, Vx meaning to the side. Uh, but we do know this is this is quite noisy, and that's not surprising since velocity measurements will tend to be much noisier than position estimates. And we'll show you how we try to address that next. So then the final topic is our attempts to, um, to merge Quest and Vest together and get better overall performance. So um, first of all, at this point, we're, there's still a need to solve for rotation and angular velocity independently. Um, but then we can solve for the translation and linear velocity and all the depths simultaneously. So if you remember our two sets of equations for solving the linear sets of equations for translation and velocity and depths, they're pretty similar formats. So we can just combine them into one very large matrix and a larger vector. Um, and the nice thing here is that if you note the VI in both sets of equations is the same. It's the view of the, of the current image. And so uh, this adds something of a constraint between the two sets of equations and also helps to ensure that they have the same um, scale factor. Um, then though, we want to look at uh, really fusing them. And so you note that really the the quaternion and angular velocity should agree over time, and the translation and linear velocity should agree over time, in the sense that if you integrate velocity, you should get displacement. Um, and so we explored the use of an extended Kalman filter. Um, if you were at our, our last workshop, I was presenting the results of an extended Kalman filter, but it, it just didn't work that well. And my suspicion is that this is due to that um, really, we're working with quaternions, which are not a vector space. Um, so addition and subtraction of quaternions is not a group action. You, you should be using the uh, quaternion multiplication as your group action. Um, also, the innovation, meaning um, when you are calculating how much you need to change your, um, your prediction based on the measurements, you need to be using the Lie algebra of the, of the quaternion space. Um, also multiplication of rotations, even with that proper group action is not commutative. And so a, a non-commutative algebra just cannot be represented by vectors. So the EKF is just not a good choice for an approach to do um, sensor fusion with these types of spaces. So um, for systems on lead groups though, there is a, a more recent uh, type of approach called the invariant uh, extended Kalman filter. And there's actually a number of different papers on this. Um, and there's also some people who specifically looked at approaches for the quaternion um, when you're doing rigid body motion. So we based our approach on a method by uh, Botella et al, uh, state estimation for humanoid robots. And um, you know, some of this looks a lot like a common filter. So especially for the translation and velocity, it's just, those are linear. Um, so they're essentially the same as a um, extended common filter you would be familiar with. But for the quaternion, um, we need to be using the group actions. Um, the, so the Lie algebra and also the group actions in order to, um, in, in place of, of um, multiplication and in place of addition. Uh, so you also see that the, um, the update step is a bit different. So again, we're taking advantage of the uh, Lie algebra for quaternions, um, but the translation and velocity are pretty much the same as what you would normally see. Your column gain is calculated the usual way. Um, it's 
fairly difficult to come up with your linearized matrices um, of well, F and H and et cetera, you know, your, your, um, your, your state transition matrices. But and once you have those, then your, um, your column gain and your error covariance matrices are predicted in the usual way. So in any event, as we have a few minutes left, I can show you these. This is what I was talking about. Like I got some of these yesterday. <laughs> Um, and so here's an example where we walk around, I walked around a square while viewing this, we extracted a large set of feature points. Uh, so what we expect to see is translation along X, then back along Z, then um, back along X and forward along Z. And we more or less see that this is the raw quest. Once we put it in the, the incorporate it with this QEKF, we see much smoother motions, um, especially with the velocity, which was, very difficult to make much for the raw vest. But once we put in the call filter, it's much smoother. We also see very little rotation, which we expect. Um, an example where we I move the camera down towards the object while twisting it. So we see this nice rotation along the Z axis, a little bit along the X axis. Velocity makes sense. We see rotation about Z. Here is the problem at this point. If I can get it to update. Um, we have this bad lag. Um, so there's a very notable lag between what the Kalman filter, between the measurements and the Kalman filter, especially in the quaternion. So you can see how this occurs um, like four seconds to, and all of our attempts to resolve that lag haven't worked. So the usual stuff you would do with QEKF, sorry, with an EKF of, you know, making a rotation, your 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 error, your, your um, measurement error covariance matrix and your process noise covariance matrix, your measurement noise covariance matrix, you would usually play with these and tune them to get that um, that lag reduced, and it's just it's not working. So I don't know if there's just something fundamentally different about the invariant Kalman filters or the QBKF, but well, that's one thing we're trying to, to solve. And I wish we had another week before this workshop because I think we would have. Um, so since I'm pretty much out of time, I'll go ahead and skip that last result and uh, you know just to sort of what I've summarized here. We're still working on this QAKF approach. Um, we need to incorporate the scale factor into this in order to improve things a lot. Um, I like some of what I've seen today. Um, some of Warren's work, I think, and Kaveh's work especially, are things that we could leverage in order to help with occlusions or making sure that our feature point matches are, are um, really the robust and the best. Um, you can find our papers um, that have been published on this. Uh, Kaveh has made most of the code that he wrote publicly available, and I believe VEST is up there as well. And just to acknowledge some of the people who worked on that QAKF that we took most of their, their work in order to base ours on. So um, thank you, everybody. And I will um, take questions, I guess, in the chat or after um, our next two talks.